Hello, and a very warm welcome to our 50th Breakfast with Arab talk. <laughs> it really is so good to see you here. So my name is Farah, and I am the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. Born in Greenwich, Mel is passionate about London. As a young girl, she always liked fixing things and solving problems. She also grew up watching the Thames Barrier being constructed literally at the end of her street. Inspired by this feat of engineering through a meandering journey, Mel came initially to work for Arab for two weeks as part of work experience in the environmental services team, and she's been here for 10 years. Her first project was about water meters and was rather imaginatively called, wait for it, retrofitting water features meters in difficult to reach London domestic properties. <laughs> you can see how that trips off the tongue. Mel initially studied a degree in technology through Open University whilst at Arab and went on to study a master's in environmental design and engineering at UCL. Mel is a gifted farmer and owns a 10 by 10 metre plot. She is currently harvesting leeks, planting garlic and preparing her gooseberries. Her other passion is cycling. Mel will be heading off to the Cairngorms with her bivy bag, which as I understand is an expensive black bin liner that goes over a sleeping bag. Not surprisingly, I've never heard of a bivy bag. <laughs> In her day-to-day -day work at Arab, Mel is equally as passionate about changing the world, one building at a time. During her 10 years, Mel has built up an amazing team of dedicated practitioners, and she inspires loyalty amongst her colleagues. The projects that Mel enjoys the most are, not surprisingly, the awkward refurbishments, especially those that are most constrained by our urban, gritty environment. Mel loves working on a building where virtually everything is a challenge and especially unloved architecture. Some of her projects include Chiswick Park, the Adelphi Building, the Royal Opera House Costume Store and 52 Lime Street. And finally, the stunning Capsart Project Renewable Energy Research Centre which became operational in summer 2016. So, without further ado, I'm really very happy to introduce the very lovely and super talented Mel Allward, who will tell us all about the forgotten many this morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Farah. Good morning, and thank you all for getting up quite so early. I'm planning to talk to you this morning about three things. Why we should be building more sustainable buildings, which you know already, so I'll be brief. What a more sustainable building might look like and how we can get to there from here. I don't think I need to emphasise that the science behind climate change is irrefutable now with impacts on every front. Heat waves, flooding, extreme storm events, moving on to social dislocation, biodiversity loss, etc. Last year was yet another hottest year on record. And it's really difficult to be optimistic in this climate, but I'm going to anyway. The Paris Agreement, also known as COP21, was ratified last year, standing out as a positive milestone in what was politically a particularly turbulent year. The reason COP21 matters is that it was a global agreement signed by countries responsible collectively for the majority of greenhouse gas emissions. It sets out their commitments for significant carbon reductions in the hope that we will keep the increase in global surface temperatures below 2 degrees C. The UK signed up to COP21 on the basis of our membership of the EU, but regardless of our future relationship with the continent, the UK already has a national, legally binding commitment to achieve an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. It's not as challenging as COP21, it's not exactly the same, but both are roughly aligned in that they require the UK to make deep reductions in our emissions over the next 33 years. So let's look at the UK's progress so far. This graph shows where we're trying to get to, the green stick at the end. The red bars are the milestones along the way that should keep us on track. The blue line is our progress so far. And it kind of looks promising so far. Looks like we're, you know. But much of this early progress 
was achieved through initial decarbonisation of the grid, the so-called dash for gas, moving from intensely carbon uh, heavy power stations fired by coal to less carbon intensive power stations fired by gas. And there's a limit to how far we can go with this relatively low hanging fruit. To get through the next few steps, we're going to have to do some of the hard stuff, things like behaviours, like transport, and my focus today, buildings. It's important to recognise that the UK government does not yet have policies in place that will take us all the way to our target. The red triangle here is the gap between what we know we could do and what we actually need to do. And given that buildings directly and indirectly represent 37% of the UK's total carbon emissions, it's likely that tighter buildings focused policies will emerge over time. Sure, we're going to need some help from further grid decarbonisation, but our buildings are going to have to get a lot better. And all of these buildings are designed, constructed, operated, <coughs> refurbished and demolished by people like us in this room. So if we're going to get a low carbon future, it's the talent in this room that's going to get us there. So what does a more sustainable building look like? I think we've all got a pretty clear idea in our head of what it might look like. It's probably made of wood. It's probably covered in visible vegetation. There might be some swiveling <laughs> chimneys. There are definitely bat boxes and bicycle racks. <laughs> this is what Google Image Search thinks a sustainable building looks like. And this is what London looks like now. It's not very much like the pictures in the Google search. If we're going to meet our climate targets, we're going to need to solve this problem for real buildings, like the ones we see here in the picture. And before we give up in despair at the complete disparity between those two pictures, I'd like to throw in an example showing how it's possible for change to happen. When I was growing up in London, it was widely accepted that the UK were terrible at sport. And then along came the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, USA, to prove it. We came away with one gold medal, which had to be shared between Matthew Pinsett and Steve Redgrave. <laughs> Fast forward 20 years. We see a very different picture, 167 medals, 27 of them gold, and an astonishing second finish overall. So it's worth remembering that if we care enough about something and spend our money wisely, we can make a poor position better. But before we go any further, I'd like to question my own paternality a little bit. It's not going to be enough for us to deliver 67 gold medal buildings by 2050. That will not get us to our climate goals. What we need is for the entire building stock to get better. The equivalent, in our analogy, of getting hundreds of thousands of school kids regularly running around the playground at lunchtime every day. To illustrate, here's a breakdown of the energy performance of the London commercial office market. The data is based around EPCs, and I acknowledge the attendant weaknesses. But the shape is enough to tell us what we need to know. To get to our 2050 targets, roughly speaking, we need the central gravity of this graph to be about here, where this red arrow is. That's a pretty big change. If we were going to use our Olympic route, we would pull the good end of the graph all the way this way. But we're never going to get the shape we need like that. We can't move the bulk. What we actually need to do is to shove the graph a big step to the right and make our average buildings better. If you wanted to make this change, if you wanted to get the average fitness of the population up, you wouldn't transform a couple of hundred people into superhumans. You'd spread your attention and your budget a little bit thinner and you'd put a process in place for persuading millions of school kids to run around more. Is this possible? Why don't we do it already? Can we make it into a process so it happens routinely? Change is possible. I'd like to offer you two stories this morning. First of all, I'm going to take you way, way away. The first is emphatically not a London office project. Known as CAPSARC, it's a renewable energy research centre in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And this may seem like a curious place to start, but the setting is so inhospitable on the sustainability front that it makes a great laboratory to understand what's possible when everything's stacked against you and what kind of process might take you there. <coughs> if we can make it work here, we can make it work anywhere. So, building a home for a new, cutting-edge, renewable energy research centre in the desert in Saudi Arabia obviously calls for some world-class architecture, 
supplied here in abundance by Zaha Hadid Architects. I was lucky enough to work on this project from the inception with the hugely inspirational Daewa Kang, who is passionate about sustainability, but at the same time uncompromising about his architecture. As a footnote to the brief for the building, the client asked for lead platinum, an audacious target as a headline, let alone as a footnote. This was challenging on every front. This is the only site I've ever worked on where the ecologist described the pre-development site as sterile. <laughs> we did see a hawk at one point. Temperatures range from minus two to plus 48, with dust storms and drought common. And in this extreme climate, our target was re to reduce energy consumption by 40% below the baseline of ASHRAE 90.1. We knew the only way, way to get there would be to start work on the energy strategy right from the outset. Early modelling and engineering experience told us that the dominant energy load would be cooling. So the building sets out to protect spaces from the sun's rays. But already we're talking a balance. Every time we hide from the sun, we're making the spaces a little more enclosed. And part of the purpose of the building is to help people collaborate, share knowledge, and just generally be exposed to chance encounters, visibility. Here are some early sketches. The sketch shows how the architect envisaged courtyards aligned to the cooling spring winds, but protected from the incoming sun. And here you can see from the beginning that the courtyard strategy allowed the design team to respond to these conflicts. Here in this instance, using some plot analysis to locate windows facing into the courtyard, below the complex horizon created by the crystalline shape, creating comfortable external transient spaces. Obviously, it's not enough to rest on the laurels of a clever concept design stage sketch. To get the energy performance we needed, we absolutely had to optimise the design at every stage, honing and tweaking all the time to improve. Throughout the design development, we continue to encounter conflicting agendas. The energy modelling team still wants as few windows as possible to minimise solar gain and make the U-values work. Meanwhile, the facade architect was also critically driven by not just the size, but also the placement of the windows, with the measure of success being all about bringing light and interest into the internal spaces and creating the external visual impact of the facade. The sketches sh here show how we worked to resolve some of these issues. They look quite clean in this one, but there was plenty of blood, sweat and tears dripping onto them by the end. The pale pink is the energy model, and the diagram unwrapped beside it is a matrix developed by the facade engineering team showing exactly how glazed and how scattered the windows on every facade could be. This gave the facade architecture the flexibility she needed to make the spaces beautiful whilst minimising the amount of cooling we needed to do. So, if this was just an energy story, it would be complicated enough, but we had to develop a comprehensive sustainability strategy and to get ourselves to lead platinum. For example, materials. The majority of the facade is comprised of GRC and glazing, and we care about its embodied carbon impact as well as its energy performance. We don't want to be shipping products around the globe unnecessarily. There's a carbon cost to it, and it doesn't support local or regional economies. So teams like ours do a balancing act. We wanted the glass to meet very stringent performance requirements. So it had to be made in an Austrian factory that's essentially a laboratory. Then we had to ask ourselves, if we have to get the glass from Austria, what other elements of the facade can we get locally? When you look at Google Maps, it doesn't look very promising. There's not loads of manufacture happening in the blue circle. So, as with the energy story, this is process again. We knew we had to have a plan early on. We knew we needed to get a watertight procurement strategy embedded in the specification, because by the time it got to site, it would be too late to start investigating local sourcing opportunities. But during design stage, we were able to break down the cost plan and identify a significant proportion of the structure and facade that could be sourced from within this blue circle. And writing what we needed into the specification was a pain, but not half as much of a pain as following up, tracking the implementation of every single aspect of the building's sustainability strategy relentlessly over the course of four years on site, on occasion in person. 
This would not have been remotely possible without the contractor's dedicated site monitoring team, who were on the case from breaking ground to closing out. So we've got a complex weave of very separate issues here, a massively ambitious energy target, which we blew through, beating the ASHRAE baseline by 45%, a very ambitious target for regional and recycled materials. Again, we blew through both of these. 30% of the materials that we used came from within that blue circle. 40% by cost contained recycled content. And every drop of water on site is recycled at least once. Did the sustainability strategy compromise the architecture? I think the pictures probably speak for themselves. It's beautiful with spaces that dance with light. Here are some examples. There were many, but these are some of my favourites. And our client achieved its green goal, a LEED Platinum Certificate. Now for what looks like initially a very different example. There's common ground though. This project also has to survive in a very harsh environment, the London speculative office market. <laughs> this is White Collar Factory, a Derwent London project. We've been working with architects AHMM, Steve Taylor, since 2008, on on-site with contractors Multiplex since 2013. And the reason I've chosen this as an example is that it's not a picture postcard sustainability project. It's not made of wood, it's not covered in creepers, <coughs> and there are no swivelling chimneys. There's no room for sentimentality here. This project lives or dies by its commercial performance, and our sustainability goals can't compromise that. The targets are challenging. EPCA, LEED Platinum, Bram Excellent, global targets for a global market. And Derwent London take their sustainability targets very seriously. The project's architectural requirements are no less rigorous than the previous example. Every detail and viewpoint was rigorously interrogated and rejected if found lacking. But once again, we knew from the outset that the energy targets would be the challenging part. Once again, early intervention in the building envelope was our only chance. The most visible manifestation of the chosen strategy are these punched rain screens. They maintain amazing views over my beloved city for the building occupants, but they also protect the spaces from incoming solar gain. The ratio of screen to punch holes varies around the building, reflecting the variable exposure to the sun's path. This focus was vital to the project's low energy cooling strategy. Cooling is provided by chilled water pipes embedded in the, in the exposed ceilings. It's a great system, silent, low maintenance, very efficient but we had to control the solar gain to keep it within the system's cooling capacity. Getting to the points where the design of the rain screens worked architecturally and delivered the energy performance we needed within the budget for the facade required an immense amount of creative, constructive collaboration, in other words, pain, from the architects and engineers, unsung heroes like Mike Steich and Gethin Rees, as well as real engagement from the client. It also required the project team to have very clear, unambiguous targets. There must have been thousands of easier, quicker solutions that just didn't quite hit the sweet spot. And we can only justify persisting if we know we're committed to meeting targets that matter. Once again, our simple energy story ends up having implications for all sorts of other aspects of building design. It meant that we can give the occupants opening windows, which we know makes people happy. But all of our energy performance will go out of the window, quite literally, if they open the window when it's too hot or too cold. We could have tackled this with a really complex control strategy, but instead they've just been given these traffic lights, telling them when it's okay to open the windows, and we're expecting them to be able to respond with their intelligence to these systems. Our energy strategy, again, has materials implications. Once again, we're relying on concrete. Concrete has a high carbon intensity, but it's also providing a benefit. Its thermal mass modulates temperatures, helping to keep the spaces cool on hot days. But in order to minimise the impact of the concrete that we had to use, we worked to maximise cement replacement in the mix and to control and monitor the sources of concrete in, in the specification. This is vital. Sustainability will remain a design stage pipe dream if we're relying on the goodness of the contractor's hearts to do better than they've tended for. What is required from us is to have a solid sustainability strategy and then write what we need into the specifications so that the contractor can price for it and deliver it. 
For White Collar Factory, it was clear to the contractor from the, the outset that the sustainability targets were going to be challenging. So again, they got a dedicated team on site to track and monitor the specifications. That gave us confidence about progress on site. So when the client came back to us asking if we could reconsider the BRIAM target, we already had a robust site-wide sustainability strategy as our foundation. So we were able to uplift the project from BRIAM 2011 to BRIAM 2014, and from BRIAM Excellent to BRIAM Outstanding, which made us happy. Again, I think the pictures show that our interference in terms of sustainability has not compromised the architecture. I love this building. So there are some very obvious themes here, examples of issues which are important on every project we do. Energy, water, waste, materials, well-being can and should be addressed every time we build or rebuild or refurbish a structure. And neither of these projects depended on doing anything radical or crazy to grasp these issues. They depend on us doing known things in a coordinated way from start to finish. No magic, just graft, perseverance, seeing things through. There are some differences as well. For example, for Capsarc in the desert, some of our energy demand reduction was won by making very tailored selections of mechanical systems and matching these to specific functions in the building. Controllable fan coil units in the offices, stable displacement ventilation in the library. Whereas with White Collar Factory, the sustainability solution was all about flexibility, adaptability, and durable minimal finishes. Whatever you want to do with this building in the future, it's going to be great. So same questions, different compromises. And it's important to note here that I haven't talked at all about the performance gap, about matching design performance and operation. That's a subject for a whole other talk given by Steve Hill and Darren Wright, which I commend to you. So these projects raise some stubborn questions. How much daylight is it OK to lose to reduce cooling demand? Does it stack up to use concrete slabs? to make our cooling systems more efficient? Is it better to use a high performance glass from Austria? Or should we use a good enough glass made from local sand in a local factory? The questions are particular, but the circumstances that create them and make sustainability difficult are familiar. Long timescales, conflicting agendas, interference between issues. And again, we know that it's not enough for us to solve these problems for these two very special projects. What we need is a process that we can follow every time. Here's my recipe. Plan early. Make sure that your plan reflects the project's priorities and make sure that the team's bought into it. Analyse the impact of what you're asking for, whether it's cost, carbon, programme, risk. All of these impacts can be overcome if we acknowledge them and can quantify them. Make sure that somebody owns the delivery of everything that's important and that the responsibility for embedding each sustainability thread sits as closely as possible to the person doing that particular part of the design or the construction. And own the compromises. Every decision you make is inter interdependent with something else. That's the fun part. That's the interesting part. So the shape of this process, define a strategy analyze the implications, make progress, test whether you've, whether you've achieved what you set out to do, isn't particular to our two examples. It's universal. And I contend that this is where our very much maligned BRIAM and LEAD checklists come into play. If used judiciously, they provide us with a framework that allows us to navigate through a reliable process, consistently identifying opportunities to do better on every single project. The checklist is not a manifestation in, an end in itself. It's a visible manifestation of this process. Here's an example of how this process-driven approach can help us to find the opportunities in every project. And I was rationed here to give you only one of my favourite Briam stories. So I've selected 20 Old Bailey, where sustainability has been driven by my colleague Dan Rowe. The project combined new build with refurbishment. And we wanted to understand the impact of retaining some of the structure so we completed a life cycle carbon assessment for which we got a BRIAM credit and demonstrated that significant retention of the structure resulted in embodied CO2 emissions of 23% compared to a new build solution. We were able to do this because BRIAM gave us both a target to meet, BRIAM excellent, 
and a framework which rewarded us for addressing embodied impact. Just to dwell on energy for a moment, we know what our checklist will consistently nudge us to deliver. With new London buildings, getting the envelope right, specifying efficient systems and lighting, and only adding renewables on site if they make sense. For refurbishments, it's commissioning or recommissioning systems and BMS to meet the design intent, tightening and insulating the envelope, upgrading lighting, replacing older chillers and boilers. Again, no magic, known solutions, executed consistently to deliver clear targets. And if you're after results, you can bet your bottom dollar that Team GB went into the Rio Olympics with a checklist or two. So, in conclusion, every project is a special case with unique needs, and yet we're all trying to achieve the same aims, to use water, energy, materials more efficiently, and to lighten our impact on our surroundings. It's easy and cool to be dismissive of the paperwork, and yes, it's really dull. This quote is from Werner, Werner von Braun. He's an actual rocket scientist who helps get people to the moon the first time around. So I think if he struggles, then the rest of us can be forgiven. But I think of it as being like a driving test. It's, it's really frustrating to have to do it yourself, but I think we'd all rather be driving around on roads where everybody else has had to jump through that particular hoop. It may not feel like it, but Briam and LEED and the sustainability checklist headaches that we put you through can help us deliver on these aspirations and on the COP21 targets and commitments. Checklists are our opportunity to make ordinary, real buildings into sustainable buildings. To go back to our original analogy, winning gold medals matters because it inspires us. But translating that inspiration into a tangible change in the UK's entire building stock requires us to commit to a robust process for consistently improving the performance of every single building that passes through our care. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, would anybody like to ask questions? Or heckle? Yeah. <laughs> the um, uh, point you made about the glass for capsite being produced in a factory in Austria could be uh, true about most of the projects in London. Yes. Uh, it's also made in a factory in Central Europe. Um, and it's more to do with the fact that uh, there's been little investment in the industry in this country rather than uh, not being able to source it. Do you think there's, a, there's a, a rationale to lobby government to reinvest in industry here so we're actually keeping material production close to uh, where we need it? Um, as a headline, yes. <laughs> um, I think we've got some really important carbon cost questions which we are becoming more and more nuanced about answering. So the embodied carbon in something like the glass is made up of a number of components, the manufacturing element, the transport element, the disposal element, and in some cases the transport element of that will be relatively small. Actually, if we can, um, if we can manufacture it far away but very efficiently, perhaps using, so to use aluminium as an example, if we can manufacture that, for example, in Norway, where most of the electricity used to generate it is hydro, then the carbon cost is not necessarily driven by the relative locations. But all other things being equal, closer is better. Yes? Hi, right, fantastic uh, <coughs> talk. Thank you very much. And, um, inspired me to do more checklists. Um, <laughs> I'm an architect, Santec, and we do a lot of healthcare work. Um, I'm sure the NHS estate is a good chunk of that 37% you're talking about. Um, in recent years, um, all new builds in um, the health uh, funded through the NHS uh, have to be BRIAM excellent. We are completely underwhelmed by the impact that that has on the outcome. We find that there is endless opportunity for clients to manipulate and contractors to some extent, but more probably clients, to manipulate the scoring to end up with a building that is compliant but really doesn't do very much. And I just don't think it's good enough. What can we do about it? 
So, um, good question, thank you. And kind of the question I was hoping for. Um, <coughs> there was a slide in there when we talked about <coughs> contending that we need to check this. I think they are necessary but not sufficient. They don't take the place of somebody taking a tool and deciding to use it well. Every time I take my spade and dig a hole in the garden, I can make a complete piece here of it. Or I can think, do you know what? Here's a tool. This is where it's trying to get me to. I can use this tool. And the money and time and goodwill and effort that that takes to get me to the right answer, not the wrong answer. And I think I wrestled with that when I was, even when I was just kind of putting the slide up that showed the picture of the checklist, because I know, I, I, I see all your faces when I walk into a room and grill them there. Oh no, we have to do the checklist thing. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem for us. It provides us with a framework, it allows us to navigate. Even when we do these things rigorously, you saw Werner von Braun complaining about the checklist that he had to do. It still meant that with the Challenger disaster 15 years later, they failed to do enough checklists to catch the O-rings working at the right temperatures. Even if we check ourselves all the time, it doesn't doesn't mean that we don't need to be good people doing the right thing with the right tools, but it helps to have a tool, otherwise I'm digging in my garden with my hands. I can still use the spade badly though. We should be, I'll tell you what we can do, we should be, um, we should treat it as unacceptable to use the tool badly. That's what we can do between us. <laughs> yes. To the point about commercial value, you know, value versus cost. Do you see any changes in the way that the kind of commercial market is valuing the sustainability performance, the way that it kind of comes into capital valuation? Do see that people are starting to equate it with quality in a way that um, we would expect to be the case if you end up at the process having just had an extra layer of trying to think about what we're doing, even things that the checklist forces us to do, like sit down at the beginning and make sure we've actually asked the client what they want, can help us lead to better results. But again, it doesn't always. I, I think we're seeing people taking it more seriously, but I don't think we're any way far enough along the journey that we would need to take if we're going to meet the commitments that we have. Good start. Let's try harder. Good start, keep going. So how does regulation play to this? Because obviously money is quite important, but if we can't <coughs> justify it in terms of cost terms, I mean, how should we sort of nationally be kind of changing the current rules? Everybody here in this room, you are all busy people. When I'm coming to you, asking you to do something <coughs> extra that isn't required, or in the brief, or in a piece of regulation that you have to do, it's going to fall down the list to last below all of the things that you have to do. And the only thing that ever gets done <coughs> on the list is the thing that's right at the top. Regulation helps us push sustainability right at the top to be something that you have to do to discharge your planning condition. When we're talking about discharging planning conditions, it's much more of an incentive for people to actually do the process well than if I stand here and talk about how we need to save the polar bears. That's, it, we all agree we need to save the polar bears, but what I need you to do is to go back to your desks and discharge that planning application showing that we've met our energy targets, and then care about the polar bears. <laughs> At the back. Uh, I work in the Higher Education Institute, and um, I can think of at least half a dozen different uh, league tables that we have to submit energy <laughs> and building information to, to rank us against different universities around the country. I was wondering, if anything equivalent would be helpful for commercial sector, for other environments, uh, to kind of increase the prestige of having a sustainable estate or set of buildings or even individual buildings? I really think it works, you know. I, I, people put, you know, I'm being glib, but people put an enormous amount of, of work into getting us to stati stati statistics like we got to up there. There's an incredible amount of effort that it takes to get you to a 45% reduction in energy targets or a 23% reduction in CO2. For me, I feel like it's not unreasonable to reward people for that. For saying you've put a lot of effort in, you spent a lot of money, you should, you know, feel good about yourselves for having you know, a, a shiny thing. It's we should we should respect the amount of effort that goes into it. I 
think. So yes, I think it helps. I don't think it's enough on its own, but I, I definitely think it helps to acknowledge and respect the amount of effort it takes, not just to do better, but to change at all. It's really difficult. But Atlanta Rio, you do get that. And I think um, acknowledgement and respect works better than shame. I came along wondering what she was going to say. The subject COP21 is controversial. A lot of people are quite cynical about the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, but I think Mel lifted the subject into a really interesting area, showing us how we can actually make a difference by talking about two amazing projects, one of which is in Saudi Arabia, and I've worked in Saudi Arabia uh, on a major hospital where we tried to get the client to do lead silver, which is much more modest than lead platinum, and didn't succeed. This obviously was a special project, but really interesting in the desert, um, an environmental research center. Uh, but hearing the details of the way the building was analyzed and modeled, not just from an aesthetic point of view, but the environmental science and the building physics. That was really interesting and how that contributed to the, the final form of the building. So that was fascinating. And then by contrast, another example in central London, um, white collar factory designed by AHMM. Um, again, really interesting how the whole design of the building, total concept, and in particular the facade, um, brought that building to life uh, as a place to work, um, but also, again, with a lot of very detailed analysis, how to, um, how to hit some very onerous uh, energy targets. So, really, two fantastic examples. Um, her conclusion, I think, was kind of the devil is in the detail. Don't throw away the checklist. Don't, throw, don't despair about the systems we have, which, I mean, my question suggests that I am despairing because I find clients are constantly finding ways to, to sort of maneuver around the systems, um, but we have to use them to do better and to inspire clients to achieve what these two exemplars have shown us. I was really inspired by Mel's talk just because it, take, it took the complex issue of sustainability and uh, really broke it down for, um, for everyone in the room, for clients, for consultants, for designers, um, also, also for main contractors um, like ourselves and what each individual um, group of people can do to help resolve this issue and take what is, can sometimes seem like a, an overwhelming issue like sustainability with so many different aspects and say, here are the little parts that we can focus on to, to help make a difference through things like toolkits. As contractors, I think it's really important to um, embrace the sustainability message, um, but I don't think it lays solely with the contractor. I think it is the entire um, team, from the client um, to the designers to the consultants and the main contractors. And like Mel was saying in the speech, it's about collaboration, which can sometimes be a bit of a pain trying to get everyone to work together. Um, but through collaboration, you get the best end results, like the buildings that were displayed in the, um, in the presentation.